<clears throat> okay, so um, my name is Habib Kande, and I'm pleased to say that I'm speaking to Jacob Elliott, who is a best-selling author from Kenya, who is the author of multiple books, over 10, I believe, or 14, non-fiction and fiction books, including the best-selling book, Unplugged, which is a, a controversial but very popular book um, about red pill and teaching men about female nature and how to navigate uh, modern day relationships. Um, I'll be looking forward to speaking to Jacob Deheri's thoughts about Red Pill, Red Pill, why he wrote this particular book, what was his inspiration behind it, and also how he became a, um, a best-selling author. Um, but before we get into that, Jacob, do you mind giving a quick elevator pitch, introducing yourself and tell you, telling us who you are? Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Habib, for this opportunity. Uh, apologies for the uh the challenges with technology uh but we're finally here um so i'm just looking forward to a very live discussion and uh the thing about uh, uh, my writing i was i was my first six books were books of fiction and uh i was really enjoying the the writing experience and the writing journey until covid happened so when covid happened uh, i have a number of uh, colleagues uh, former schoolmates and friends who got divorced. So that dog got my attention and then I started researching on uh, what's happening. So I was able to connect the dots and then uh, I decided to, to write a book about it. So that is how Unplugged came to be. Right. So, so when was Unplugged released? Was it during COVID you said? So was it 2021, 2020, 2022? Early 2022, wow. April of 2022. Wow. And what has been the, um, the, the feedback, both positive and negative, towards the book? The, okay, the, the, it was interesting because uh, initially um, I got a lot of uh, negative feedback uh, from young ladies from a certain university in Kenya. And... Uh, uh, they actually went to Nuria and uh, threatened uh, uh, the store owner that uh, he was uh, stocking a book that was spreading hate against women. Uh, but, but that worked for me because it got the attention of uh, feminists, uh, people who had done even doctorate in gender studies. So they read the book and they found that the book did not have any uh, misogynist comments and so on. They felt it was pro-men but it was not promoting you know they were saying it was promoting femicide and things like that so from there it just uh, uh it just picked like uh like fire and uh, it has not stopped since then that was uh i think around may of 2022 to date so different people have come and read it and uh, it's the most reviewed book on the nuria bookstore and uh a lot of uh I get a lot of support from both quarters, both from men and women. And of course, there are also men who don't like the book at all. There are men who've uh, reviewed the book. They say, I'm too hard. Uh, I call men beta males. Uh, they say that uh, I classify guys. So there are guys who don't like that. And then uh, there are women, particularly single mothers, who don't like uh, the book. Uh, single mothers, of course, it depends on the age. The early 30s, mid 30s early 30s or early 40s 30s to 40 there about women who are older who have mature sons who are in their 50s have been very supportive and then of course the very young ladies in their 20s they, they really don't particularly care so that has been the reception but uh, uh, for the majority of it it has been positive because many of these women also have brothers they have fathers they have sons so they have uh, they have found it to be very very positive so for the for the most of it it has been very very positive Oh, yeah, congratulations for being a bestseller. And um, I understand, like you mentioned, since the book was released, it's been a, um, a bestseller at New Year for the um, last three years. So, yeah, congratulations um, on, on, on that. Um, so, Thank again, you. just for the benefit of those who are not familiar, can you define um, what Red Pill is? Yeah, so, so uh, I'm glad you asked the question. You know, Red Pill is a metaphor. It's just a metaphor. As much as it was in the, the Matrix movie, it doesn't mean that, that we borrow anything from the, from the Matrix movie. What we are doing is that uh, the, the Red Pill just is a metaphor for the truth. Okay? 
that is what it stands for even in the movie of course the movie is fiction even in the movie the character neo was just uh, concerned about the truth so when you talk about the truth in the red pill uh it is a truth it is awareness of uh, the truth we call the red pill awareness as opposed to blue pill conditioning so we contrast the blue pill from the red pill in the sense that the blue pill is what you learn from romance novels from disney from hollywood it is what you pick in the movies and in popular culture and uh, many guys have found that uh, it doesn't really work uh, the way it is portrayed and so that is what we talk about when you talk about red pill we talk about the truth and it's the truth when it comes to intersexual dynamics in relationships marriage and so on uh, there are also people who go further and talk about red pill in terms of politics in terms of religion in terms of uh, you know how just the world affairs because even in the world affairs uh, there have always been feelings that uh, there are people in certain situations that try to craft a hyper reality so that they can take advantage of the masses and things like that but for the most part the red pill is about the truth about uh, intersexual dynamics and about relationships so it's a metaphor it's a metaphor so like you said it's a metaphor yeah. to understand like, like you said the truth and have a more of an awareness so would you say that i know you mentioned this in the book but again just for benefit of those who are listening and again if they want to know more they can obviously pick up unplugged which is available from the nuria bookstore the online bookstore which is um located in the bazaars in, in in nairobi kenya but it's available online for anyone who's outside of um kenya um so you mentioned that red pool is like um a metaphor for the truth to have a, a heightened awareness shall we say um some people yeah. say that red pill is a, a movement or a cult would you say that i mean is that correct or would you say that it's not it's, it's neither or an ideology um i think because uh the red pill the, the the kind of ideas in the red pill are not mainstream so and the the kind of social order we live under which uh, probably can be debated it's sort of very gynocentric and uh, uh it's very protective of women many people who discuss red pill ideas don't discuss it in the mainstream because of fear of being cancelled or targeted so in a sense the the voices of the red pillar exiled so that's why now you find a lot of them on uh on social media on podcasts and so on in the past it was on late night radio uh because even on 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 the even on youtube and uh instagram uh and even on twitter you know like andrew Tate was deplatformed in all of them so uh and the mccain institute uh recently classified the the leaders of the manosphere they are classified just as al qaeda or terrorist so red pill ideology in that sense uh it is uh, not being accepted by the mainstream so much so maybe that's why people can talk about it in terms of uh, a cult and so on and then i think also we have a lot of young men and even older men who are uh, very um the guys who feel very uh disappointed or bitter people have been disappointed in marriage or relationships uh a number of them have rage and uh, they are angry and so because of that uh they are treated as as dangerous and uh, many people have always uh, tried to classify the red pill as uh, it promotes uh, you know violence against women and things like that but it's because a number of these guys uh once they realize that what they were taught by the mainstream is not true and it does not yield the result they expected they become very very angry and uh, because there's nobody to kind to understand them they are now treated as a threat so i think that is where this idea of the cult thing comes in because these guys now remove themselves from the mainstream a number of them are angry they band together and so on but of course we try to talk to guys about red pill rage it's a stage it's a stage of awareness um just the same way when you believe in something then one time you realize it's not true the first feeling is is rage but there are also other things like negotiation and acceptance and so on. So some guys get stuck in that stage of rage, others get over it. Right, understood. And um, also, again, just for the benefit of those who are listening, I'm speaking to Jacob Elliott, who is a best-selling author from Kenya, 
who's written um, over 10 books, I think 14 in total, um, and including um, the Unplugged series, a three-part series, um, which is about red pill teaching men, which, which as Jacob has um, pointed out, it's about an awareness or to understand the truth, to come out of a blue pill conditioning where um, um, men somewhat have been misinformed about female nature and um, intersexual um, relationships. So Jacob has been speaking about why he wrote the book and how he became to be a, a best-selling author um, and the reasons for writing um, the Red Unplugged series. Um, it's a well-researched book. Um, he quotes from a number of different sources, both academic sources um, as well as um, a number of like contemporary events, I think, so people can relate to it. Some of the, like Jacob's mentioned, there are a number of um, feminists and some women who have felt some of the views to be quite problematic and accused them of being misogynistic, but still there are still a number of women and men who have found um, the book to be extremely beneficial. It's the most reviewed book, as Jacob's mentioned, on um, at Nuria, which is a very popular bookstore in, um, in Kenya and East Africa. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting Jacob a couple of weeks ago in Nairobi. Um, I, I personally am not really a big fan of, of Red Pill because like Jacob mentioned, and maybe a number of the people that I've come across who follow Red Pill, I found them to be somewhat socially awkward or sexually frustrated or because they maybe had a lot of um, bad experiences with women, they just seem to take it out on women and use Red Pill to justify that. But maybe those men are under are in the, um, the rage stage, shall we say, of what of the classification of, of red pill but so I'm quite I'm, I was very impressed with how Jacob articulated himself and spoke about um his views and also again I, I read the the three books and to get more of an insight and understanding of, of where he's where he's coming from now coming back to the red pill rage how if someone because again I'm just wondering because there's a lot of especially maybe in the UK or what I've come across or maybe in America because that most of my experience with red pill is what I see online how does someone um come out of this rage stage because for example if there's a man who's maybe been divorced or broke up with his girlfriend who's had he's got a lot of resentment for for women and finds this online content whether it's the men going their own way or the red pill or, or what have you but a lot of men just disparaging women how does he come out of that and then find you know is he should or should he not focus on relationships and focus on bearing himself what advice would you give to a man especially if he's in the rage stage. Okay, um, the thing about uh, red pill, rage, it is a stage, and I think it is normal. Eh? Um, it is actually good that uh, some people are in that stage because like here in Kenya, uh, we have guys who commit homicide. So someone who is in uh, that stage of rage, at least uh, they just have emotions that are negative. They're not doing something that is harmful. So what we normally do uh, for Red Bull Rage guys, you know, what normally happens is some guys look for how they can channel these emotions. So they can think negatively about women. They can join groups like Mikta or Black Pillars and so on. But um, what we do in the Red Pill is uh, we normally say that uh, the first thing about the Red Pill is it gives you explanatory. The, the, the appeal about the Red Pill is it has explanatory power. So for example, if someone has been left by the girlfriend or the wife, uh, we normally try to, to teach guys to understand why that happened. And in most of the most cases, it's normally because this guy dropped the ball. He dropped the burden of performance. He was either drunk, he was lazy, he was broke. There was something that uh, he thought that uh, wouldn't matter. But from the outcome of the relationship, it actually mattered and it brought an end to the relationship. So what we explain to them is that, for example, women uh, love value. Women, uh, the love for a woman is supposed to be to enhance her survival. So you understand female nature. And when you have an understanding, and you know, we normally say that um, most of the times, every time you are angry at somebody for doing something, it's normally because you don't understand why they've done it. And once you understand, the anger actually goes away. So the Red Bull tries to teach people about female nature so that they can understand because all they learn from Hollywood, things like unconditional love, uh, things like soulmate meets and so on, we teach them that those things actually are not true. So we teach them to accept the cold hard truths. Once that is accepted, the anger actually goes away because the anger actually comes from a place of ignorance, a place of uh, either entitlement 
or unrealistic expectations. So we try to give them information about how relationships work, what makes them work, what makes them not work. And once they have the understanding, then uh, the red pill rage actually goes away. Yeah, that's what we've seen. Understood, understood. And again, actually, just for the benefit, I think you did touch on it, but I just wanted to make it clear for the benefit of those um, who are listening. You said that um, the Red Bull Century is not really a movement or a cult, but it's a, um, what's that word I use? A praxeology. Can you, can you, can you yes. explain what a praxeology is, just for the benefit of those yes. who are listening? So, when you talk about a praxeology, what you're trying to we're trying to disambiguate it from an ideology. So a praxeology does not tell you about odds. It doesn't give you moral imperatives. It doesn't tell you whether this is evil or this is good. It just explains to you how things work. Uh, we normally use the analogy of engineering. Like it tells you, if you put a very heavy load on this kind of thing, if it exceeds this amount, it's going to break. So. Um, and the thing about uh, the red pill, when you talk about the praxeology, uh, we say one of the basic uh, ideas of the red pill is that human beings engage in purposeful behavior. And uh, every behavior that uh, a human being uh, exhibits or engages in, there's normally a purpose for it. So for example, if, uh, if your wife or your girlfriend does not find you attractive, there's a reason for that and you need to figure it out. It's not because they hate you or because uh, uh, some, some random reason. There's normally a reason and most of the times it's linked to, to survival. So uh, the red pill as a praxeology, for example, it tells you if you want uh, to be attractive to women, you as a man, you need to take up the burden of performance. You need to be able to provide. You need to be able to protect. I need to be able to provide parental investment. You need to be able to look uh, presentable. You need to have what we call command presence. You need to be confident. You need to be ambitious, things like that. So we talk about the attraction markers uh, for, for women uh, and vice versa. We also teach men to know what their uh, biological imperatives are as men and what the biological imperatives are as women. So we basically train guys to understand the frameworks around which things like attraction and desire uh, for women, how they manifest themselves so that people can be able to understand and maintain uh, relationships. Because many guys, for example, they think that uh, once you get married, uh, and maybe you have a job and you pay the bills, that is enough. They don't know that they need to take care of themselves. They need to make sure that uh, they are clean, they smell good, they, they are physically fit, and uh, they continue improving themselves and things like that. So those are some of the things that, uh, that we teach you guys. So in terms of the praxeology, we tell you that this is what you need to do. So of course you can ignore it. You can decide you're going to grow fat and become overweight and obese, and then you're going to deal with the results uh, of that. Or you can decide that um, a woman cannot cheat once she's married, and then you live with the consequences of that. So that's what we mean when you talk about the praxeology. We tell you that this is how you can navigate relationships. Uh, and then you decide whether you can follow them or whether you can ignore them. Understood. I mean, much of that makes perfect sense. And um, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I, I don't see, I'm, I'm trying to, obviously we'll come to some more of the controversial parts because I don't think anyone in their right mind would think that's, you know, bad advice or wrong, or wrong information because I think yeah that's true that men should should essentially shouldn't let themselves go the same way they wouldn't expect their female partners whether it's their girlfriend or their wife you know to let themselves go in a long-term relationship men should themselves like maintain that the the, the the way that not only financially but also like physically so i don't think m much people will dispute with that there is a lot of controversy especially online um amongst people who have who are critics of red pill in relation to what people perceive to be like a double standard um, where, mm. and again, please correct me if this is a misunderstanding of the red pill or it's a different form of red pill where some people accuse the red pill of basically saying that men can have multiple sexual partners can womanize, can be promiscuous, whereas women can't. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you're understanding, if, if, that's, if that's a correct assertion of, of red pill? Because oftentimes I'm, I'm hearing women often accuse people that follow red pill that they say that they encourage men to sleep around and they can be high value, whereas a woman um, shouldn't be 
obviously engaging in multiple sexual partners and being promiscuous. Can you touch on that? Does Red Bull teach men to be promiscuous? No, it doesn't. Uh, we actually discourage men from being dick driven because what happens when you're very pro promiscuity, uh, other than just uh, exposing you to disease and even danger, because sometimes you sleep with the men, women who are committed in other relationships. It is actually a waste of time. It wastes your time as a man. Like if you have a purpose you want to achieve and you want to spend your time on promiscuous activities, as a man, it's a net loss for you. Um, we so it's something we don't we don't encourage, but we also recognize that uh, within the society, men of a certain level of caliber of achievement. Um, they're given a free pass as far as uh, promiscuity is concerned. Uh, in the sense that, that uh, when you look at the, re the relationship between men and women, there are men of a certain caliber who women demand commitment and monogamy from. And there are also men when they reach a certain level. I think Nick Cannon is one of them who has come out openly uh, impregnating multiple women and still other women are lining up to be impregnated by him without any serious commitment. So we see this, uh, and uh, even in terms of uh, within our society, um, we have, for example, a musician from Uganda called Diamond Platinum, who has been impregnating different women, even across the region, not just, across, not just in his country. And still several women are going uh, for him. So it, it makes, uh, Red Bull looks at such phenomena and uh, it gives an evaluation. You know, it, it, we normally say that uh, women set rules for, for better males and they break them for alphas. Uh, so that is what we say. So we don't say that, uh, because certainly what, what the red pill really emphasizes for men is that they need to be high value men. And you're not going to be high value if you're focusing on being a promiscuous person. So that is certainly not true. But we also push back and say that there are certain men in the society that women break rules for, and there are also certain men that they make rules for. So that is what we say. We don't say that uh, guys should be promiscuous, but we observe that in the society, men are not treated the same. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. That's, that's, that's true. Um, I mean, that's uncomfortable for some people, but I do agree that that's just the reality, that if you're a person of status and... Um, well, that yeah, there's people you're more likely to get away with certain things in in a relationship than than if you wasn't. So, yeah, I I, dis, I definitely agree with that. So, are you saying that with red pill, it's it's a case of really just telling people the way things are, as opposed to saying this is rather than like giving a prescription, saying this is what how you should be. Is that is that correct? Because I think maybe like a lot of what you're saying, I think it makes sense and it seems to be morally driven and ethically driven. Whereas a lot of the Red Bull content or um, commentators that I hear from, especially maybe in the US and some in the UK, maybe because they're a bit more immature and young in age, they mainly kind of talk about Red Bull in a, in a sense of become a high value man, become a wealthy man, then all mm. women will want to be with you. You can sleep around with multiple women and all of those women will still be loyal to you because you have money and status. So that doesn't seem to be the message that I'm getting from you and even from reading your book so i just maybe maybe that's a different type of red pill content that you're talking about compared to maybe what is um popularized um yeah. so yeah sorry let me just clarify you see that there are also uh stages i could say stages of understanding for example i have uh have people who follow me but they have not read my book so the understanding of red pill is completely it is in complete and it is distorted. It's a distortion of what I teach. So maybe either they don't like reading or they are lazy or it's just, uh, uh, it's just a deficit of insight. So that, that happens. It's just the same way I think even in, in, in religion and even in class. People don't really understand things the same way. But also, I also know that um, there, we have, of course there are controversial things about the red pill. For example, uh, you're told to treat a woman like a queen. The West has a lot of that. They tell you, you know, you need to give your woman queen treatment. Uh, the red pill talks about that. 
it says if you treat a woman like a queen she treats you like a subject and uh, this is derived from the experiences that uh, men have had in relationships and in marriage and the one you've just mentioned we we try to be very clear that the fact that you have money or you are rich or you have status does not mean that of course women can be attracted to money but it doesn't mean they'll be attracted to you so we try to make that distinction and we say that if you try to use your money to get a woman that is what we call negotiating desire and we say desire cannot be negotiated because we have so many cases of people who have money and they have a lot of women and when they run out of money the women disappear then they start getting depressed and committing suicide and so on so we try to tell guys that it is not enough to have money it is not enough to have muscles it is not enough to have status in the society there are other things that will make you desirable to women not just those external markers uh, of either status or achievement and so on so of course there's a lot uh, that the red pill talks about some of them like when you talk about uh, treating a woman like a queen some of them is just a pushback from the culture that that is being perpetuated uh, from the West. Uh, in those cases, then you can almost say it's like a it's like a prescription because we tell you if you do this, this is what you are going to get. If you treat her like a queen, she'll treat you like a subject. She's going to think that maybe she had the wrong guy, and she's going to look for men that she can look up to because women want men who are leaders, men who are confident, not men who supplicate to them. So those are some of the things that uh, we tell guys, and they they can be very controversial, of course. No, I think you for clarifying that and i think again that's why i think such discussions are important because whilst it's good and obviously your book is a bestseller that a lot of people are reading it but there are also a number of people who are not reading it or haven't read it so they may be just seeing some clickbait um articles or videos and not really understood where you're coming from so i'm glad you're you, you've kind of clarified that um on the topic of um high value man um and i know you touched on this on the book and again if people want to know more then obviously by all means, read the Unplugged series, um, which is available from Luria, like I said. But we're just touching on th some of the high-level topics. But again, if you want more detail, then you can check out Jacob's books, which, again, like I said, they're available from Nuria Bookstore, which I'll put on the link once um, once it's uploaded. Um, but, yeah, sorry, with the high-value high man, can you explain what a high-value man is? Because I understand there's different definitions. I know Kevin Samuels, he had the definition of a high-value man, and some people have other definitions can you give a very high level overview in terms of what it means to be a high value man okay so um the, the word of course as or the expression uh, it has suffered a lot of uh, lack of precision in terms of the meaning uh kevin someone has tried to give it a, a definition but of course this definition was based largely uh in the u.s sort of context or demographic and even within the u.s you know when you're talking about someone who is living in kansas someone who is living in in uh, in new york when you're talking about the kind of income a high value man makes monthly uh it, what 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 can be high value in kansas may not be high value in new york and so on but in general when you talk about a high value man a high value man is someone who who has a lot of resources and uh, this person also uh, is a, a very useful person, a very useful member in the community. So it means if you have a lot of resources and you're not helping anybody, you're not of benefit to the community, then you're not a high value man. So you need to be have a lot of resources. Now what resources are, of course, it depends on the context. Like if you're in a fishing community in a village and uh, you are the fisherman whose boat regularly brings a lot of fish, then you are a high value man in that particular community. If it is earning $10,000 uh, monthly in the US, maybe it's in Kansas or in California, then the, the, the context matters. So you must have a lot, lot of resources, you must be useful to the community. And then uh, also very important was have a link, have a, a network of other high value men so that you can be able to collaborate and, uh, and uh, support each other. Uh, to deal with a lot of different contexts or situations, whether it's an economic crisis and so on. So you are not a lone wolf, you have other high value men. It means you are also respected and you are recognized by other high value men. And then also, it is also important uh, that you must have been a high value man for more than six years and so on. 
because there are also people who have resources for a short while you know one one hit wonders and then they disappear and that's why even Kevin someone used to say that uh, uh, he did not classify uh, the the highly paid athletes in the NBA and NFL as high value because a number of them they make poor decisions and they, they lose all the money that they are making and then you also say that you need to have at least a LinkedIn level visibility what that means is that we need to know how you're making your money if you're uh, someone who is rich but nobody knows how you make your money then you cannot also be a high value man because you could be doing some illegal stuff and things like that so this issue of high value was based on uh, those particular parameters and uh, people normally confuse high value with being a, a, a morally upright person uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, obtain that if you're high value, you're also a morally uh, upright person. So, but basically it was just about that. It was about influence, about resources, it's about a network and it's about being useful uh, to your community. You know, for example, we have the story of Robin Hood who could rob uh, people and then he gives it to the poor. So he, in that sense, the poor can view him as a useful and a good person. But maybe the rich people is robbing can view him as, as an evil person. So, but about high value, you need to be useful to the people around you. So it was not just about accumulating resources, but also helping others. I hope that answers the question. No, it does. And I'm glad you said that. And I think it's important for people to understand because I think what gets often lost in translation is that when people are just thinking about high value men, especially the men, they think they're not, they're not realizing which you've spoken about, that it doesn't include, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a morally upright person or you've got a good character. So this is where I think a lot of people, again, maybe red pill content creators get a lot of pushback is because if the red pill is saying women are attracted to high value men, yeah, that might be the case. But if those high value men, for example, don't have any character, you know, they might be doing illegal activities or, you know, they're not morally upright, they might attract women women for temporary purposes maybe maybe because the women want their money but in terms of long term and i would even argue that a lot of those women that they're with they don't ultimately even respect those men so this is where i think some of the men especially maybe some of the men who are not as refined or educated they they often conflate if you're high value that the woman you're going to get the woman's loyalty but obviously you've spoken about that money itself doesn't mean that you'll get her loyalty and her desire like you spoke about the negotiated desire so i'm glad you said that it's just that like i said i think that message i don't think a lot of people hear that they just hear if i'm a high, high value then i can literally do whatever i like and women will want to be with me and that, that's not, obviously not always the case I'm, I'm glad you kind of clarified that and obviously i did hear I've listened to a lot of Kevin Samuels' content and he did talk about that, but maybe because those are not the videos that go viral, a lot of people are not really aware of um, his, when he spoke about like a lot of athletes and entertainers are generally not high value. And also something that I want to touch on, if you can expand on the importance of um, discipline, because that's something I think that a lot of men struggle with. Myself as well when I was younger, you know, when you're a bit young and reckless, um, and I think that's also important that men understand the importance of having you know, sexual discipline or dick discipline. Can you, can you touch on, on, on what that is and why you think it's important or if you think it's important for men? Yeah, but just before I talk about dick discipline, there's something that uh, I, I think you've touched on it, but I, maybe I need to go deeper on it. Um, you know, one of the things that... Uh, we learn from western media is, is that uh, women are attracted to men who are morally good and that is not true that is not true because uh, there's something called hybristophilia i don't know that you've heard of it no. hybristophilia is a psychological condition where someone is attracted to a criminal and uh, uh, there was a very famous case of uh, a jailbird in the U.S. whose photo leaked into the newspapers, and uh, uh, the women felt he was very handsome, and they they would visit him in prison and even offer to have sex with him. And hypistrophilia, I've written about him in my my third book, eh, where there's a very beautiful attorney even in the U.S. who 
who smuggled a prisoner out of prison and uh, because she was in love with him uh, so ibisophilia is 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 one female dynamic it's a female dynamic because we don't observe it in men we don't see men who are attracted to female criminals uh, it's something you can look up but there's also something called the stockholm syndrome stockholm syndrome of course uh you've heard about the stockholm syndrome yes it's also a female dynamic mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a robbery happening. He's in the Stockholm Syndrome for those who are listening who may not be familiar with what that is. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, traditionally, traditionally, women who exhibit Stockholm Syndrome are being treated as victims. And uh, they're normally, they overlook uh, the dynamic behind it in the sense that people just say, ah, oh, no, these women are attracted to these criminals because they didn't have a choice and so on. But it's actually a female dynamic. Then there's also what we call the dark side personality. And this we see in the Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey, of course, uh, it talks about bondage and the BDSM and so on. But Fifty Shades of Grey became one of the highest gross, uh, the, one of the highest, uh, 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 the best performing films because women particularly traditional conservative women were really uh the biggest fans of 50 shades of gray because they like to be dominated uh they like men who are strong they like men who are powerful and they like men who treat them the way this guy was teaching treating the women in the movie but this is something that um it is not discussed openly so when you talk about the dark side personality you talk about uh narcissism uh machiavelli Machiavellianism and psychopathy and when you look at the, the way uh, the dynamic between women and men uh, mo most of the times when you talk about when you say uh, women like bad boys bad boys generally are people who have those characteristics either they are narcissists or they're psychopaths or they're Machiavellian so they're manipulative they put themselves first they're very domineering and so on those are the men that women find desirable we have, of course, been taught that you need to be a nice person, you need to be a decent person, and so on. But in general, what happens is that uh, when you're all those things, you're an attractive person, you're a good person. It means a woman can invest for you, on you in the long term. You can be a good father, you can be a good husband, you can be faithful, you can be loyal, and so on. That makes you attractive, but it doesn't make you desirable. So now when you talk about the desirability of a man, you talk about this dark triad personality and it talks about this part of female nature that nobody talks about in the mainstream so the, the red pill actually talks about this and that's i think where the departure is and um, so when you talk about uh high value men that's why when you talk about uh you see for example uh i'm going to talk about let's say donald trump donald trump uh the former president, maybe he's going to be the next president again. You look at his cases, you know, the hash funds, Tommy Daniels, the things he used to do, uh, like, um, you know, borrowing uh, money from uh, businesses and then not paying and then challenging you to go to court and things like that. The way he's made his billions, uh, not 100% ethical, you know, there are so many cases uh, against him and so on. But you see, uh, that has not made him less desirable uh, for the women. And uh, those are some of the things we talk about. Because when, when, when you look at a man who a woman finds desirable, most of the times uh, these are guys who have either some degree of, of violence, that means that he can protect this woman using the violence, or he can actually get resources from other men using that violence and so on. Because women prioritize uh, survival. So what has happened in masculinity circles uh, and in the West, these aspects of masculinity like aggression, like violence, like uh, being forceful and being assertive, you are told that they are, they're not nice things. You need to be a nice guy. So you find we are men are raised to become very mellow, very agreeable, because they think that is what makes them uh, desirable to women, but it doesn't. So those are some of the things also we talk about in Red Pill. We are told that um, you need to be able to be assertive, put yourself first. Don't be afraid of uh, telling a woman no, for example. Because what we learn from the West is that you need to be a nice person, 
uh, happy wife, happy life, treat her like a queen and things like that. But what happens is that those things, they don't make you desirable in the end because women are looking for strength uh, in men. And most of the times, this strength comes out in terms of those dark tribe personalities. Even if you look at uh, the leaders, politicians that have mentioned Donald Trump, Napoleon Bonaparte, and so on, most of the political leaders and men who lead communities, they are men who have this characteristic. They are either Machiavellians, they are narcissists, or they are psychopaths. They put themselves first, and uh, they pursue the goals they want in a very aggressive fashion. So that is one of the areas where the red pill uh, departs from uh, what the mainstream actually teaches people, particularly as far as uh, being desirable and being attractive. We are normally taught about, now that's what we call about, we call the better backside of hypergamy. People are taught about the better backside. You need to have money to take care of your family. You need to be protective. You need to be a parent and so on. But the alpha fuck side, nobody talks about. But this alpha fuck side, uh, it talks about parts of female nature that is not flattering. And that's why nobody talks about it. But the red pill talks about it. So that's just what I wanted to mention as far as... Uh, and so that's why when you talk about high value, we are not very keen about... Uh, whether you are a good person or a bad person, because you know we have laws of the land, we have moral codes and things like that. But we are also observing female behavior and female nature, the way women behave towards criminals, the way they behave towards men who are very assertive, the way they, they behave towards men who are in charge, and men who other men either fear or respect. So that is what uh, Red Bill talks about. Uh, I hope I've clarified that. Maybe now I can go to, to being dick-driven. You have said... Yeah, before we get into um, dick discipline, that's a, actually I'm glad you've, we can maybe expand a little bit about a bit more about what you've said because I've got a bit of pushback. Um, and this is some of my gripes with the red pill is that it it generalizes women or even generalizes men because some of what you said I, I do agree with, but some of it I, I, I disagree with it in the sense that the say even. I think figures like, um, okay, women like bad boys. What type of women are we talking about? That's the first thing I'll, I'll be thinking about. Because if you're speaking about women of a certain age, especially maybe in their late teens, in their teenagers to early 20s, quite young, inexperienced, maybe that's the case. But women of maybe a bit more mature, a bit more educated, I don't think that attraction to bad boys is really like a a young juvenile or immature mentality that's the first thing i'll so what a woman finds attractive in a man in her 20s or teenagers may be very different from a woman uh, in her 30s or 40s the same way as a man what you find attractive in a woman in your teens is very different to your to your 30s or 40s that's why i just think when they just say things like women like bad boys it's a bit lazy in the sense if i'm talking because it's like what type of women are you talking about and then even this idea that women like the bad boys and the criminals if those criminals are to those women attractive yes they will be they wouldn't probably care about his morals and ethics and how he's made that money but just because you're a criminal in and of itself to say that women are attracted to you i don't necessarily buy that because there are a number of criminals who don't get any attraction who women aren't attracted to especially because of the way they look or maybe the way they carry themselves because maybe they're not assertive so being assertive i wouldn't necessarily say that's a bad thing it's just that you know yourself and you're not someone who lets women walk all over you i wouldn't say that maybe like it's maybe like you said because in the west they teach men to be somewhat placid i can understand where you're coming from in terms of being a nice guy but to be morally upright to be ethical to be a man of your word to be a man of character i wouldn't that just to be a decent human being that if a woman of value would respect that but then if you've got a woman of low value wants someone who is manipulative and this and the other then my question is why would you as a not you person but why would a high value man or a man of respect want to associate himself with that type of woman and i would also say that there are a number of men who are attracted to women who are like maybe very promiscuous as much as they might deny that maybe but they're attracted to and they desire women who are like um sex workers or adult film stars porn stars and a lot of men like love of those women and are desirous of them but they may be not desirous of them in terms of a long-term relationship but as men we differentiate the, between the two like yes he might want to sleep with her but he doesn't want to marry her and likewise there might be a number of women who might want these high-profile men 
in terms of they desire them for their money or maybe even to sleep with them but it doesn't mean they in, want to be with them long term or they want to marry them or they even respect respect them and that's just the thing why uh, that's just something why i think that the messaging that the red pool gives is very generalistic that women just desire bad boys women desire and you pick examples of high profile people who are maybe like criminals and maybe have got women that still desire them but it doesn't mean those women necessarily respect them or they want to be with them long term so that's why i just think yeah that's just a bit of my pushback in in kind of what you said but um yeah do, do you have anything wait to wait have yeah 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 it is a lot you know um <laughs> you know okay you're right right eh? you're right but uh i think you don't cover the whole spectrum for example it is true that women in their 20s like bad boys that is true however um you know when you talk about hypergamy they there's there's a sexual maturation of women and uh like women who in the who are in the cougar stage they also like bad boys but also when you're looking at uh uh desirability in women we also look at the ovulatory cycle so um when they are approaching uh their menstruation Okay, when the, when the women are ovulating, that is the point also they feel, okay, the, the, what we, we, we normally talk about what we call a short-term interest in the alphas. The alphas are now what we call now like the bad boys. It's normally a short-term interest. When they're not ovulating, they're not interested in that. They want the security that the beta bucks guys or that the beta male are going to provide. So uh, when you're looking at female nature, you don't look at it as uh, something that is is consistent it's something that fluctuates with age and also with the ovulatory cycle and uh, now you see when when you say not all women of course not all women are like that that is also true not all women are like that but uh, it is something that, that uh, we feel confident to say that majority of women are like that but also because of you know like the kind of message you've just given it's like you're shaming them you know uh what kind of a man wants a woman like that it's like you're not accepting it you feel that women who would be attracted to criminals are either are damaged or they have a problem and so men should actually uh no normal no normal man would want to associate with women like that but you see that is where you're wrong because there are actually survival advantages why these women will be attracted to such kinds of men because for example if if a woman is with this criminal character they are walking down a street and uh, something happens or maybe the other guys who want to harass her you see this criminal is going to protect her very violently and with the deadly force as opposed to a nice guy so you may be looking at it like you know that's a criminal yes it's a criminal but in a hind brain she also knows that that guy can give up better protection than habibu is a nice guy who is not a criminal who does not like violence so that is how the dynamic actually works. And uh, most of us who've been taught to be nice guys, when you see this in women, we think that there's something wrong with men, with them, the way you've just said. But when we share experiences, even to when we'll meet next, by the way, we are meeting on Saturday about that men's conference. Many of these guys will tell you the experiences they have had. I wish you could be able to attend. And uh, a number of them have actually been nice. And then you find she's cheating on you with a guy who you feel either is broke. He's not a guy who is even a high achiever. But you'll see he has some certain characteristics that you don't have. You as a very polished, educated guy uh, who is well kept and so on. And so that, that is what the Red Pill teaches guys that women, they have the long-term interest which you can provide as someone who is uh, educated, who is decent, who is moral and so on but they also have the short-term interest in the alpha who could be a jailbird or who could be someone who is not such a high achiever but that is a guy who makes her way that's a guy who she feels desire for she feels attracted to you because of the security you give but that guy also has the qualities of the alpha that she's hardwired to feel attracted towards so that is the thing um and and we see this in our leaders even right now in kenya and I think it's all over the world. The side chick phenomenon is really increasing because of this. Most of these side chicks, they'd rather be with those 
rich guys who are willing to cheat than get a faithful guy who earns less and who is nice and start a family with them. So many women would rather be just beside chicks for those alphas and leave these better guys alone. And uh, we normally say we're, every time you see a woman telling you where are all the good men, it's because she's overlooking the good men that are around her. Uh, the men that she really wants are already married. And most of the times those guys have alpha qualities. This is one of the reasons why uh, among the red pill and even manosphere, we normally say that 80% of women, they want to fuck the top 20%. They're not interested in the other 80% of, of, of beta males. So there are, nuan there are nuances. Uh, not all women may be like that, but we think a good number, a majority of women actually have, have that in them. Sorry, that statistic, can you say that again? You said 80, can you just say that again for the benefit of? We say that 80% uh, of women want to fuck the top 20% of men. They overlook the, the other 80% of men. And uh, that's why you find them saying that uh, all men are trash. You know, when the women say, like, Tommy Laren, I don't know, you know the Tommy yeah, Laren no, video. No. Which yeah. means, all, all men are trash. What she means is that the men she's dating are trash. But the nice guys who, are, who want her, she's overlooking them. She's not interested in them. No, that's true. And again, that's what I mean. Like, like women who say that online, I don't really take pay too much attention to when they say that because... It's getting it's hyperbole, and the same way a lot of I, I look at the red pill. Much of what the red pill is saying is it, it feels like it's a reaction to feminism, where feminists mm -hmm. will say that all men are trash and men are this, men are that, and then you find a lot of red pill guys will say something similar because of maybe their bad experiences and what they've heard. I mean, to say that eighty percent of women want to sleep with twenty percent of men, I've heard that statistic. People say that, but I'm quite skeptical in terms of where. Where, where did that statistic come from? And how did how do they validate that? I mean, you're able to shed light. Where, where, do you, where do they get that from? Um, I think it's, 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 a, it's just, a, of course, it's an approximation. I don't think it's a strict, it's a strict figure. But, but, but um, sorry. it is what we see in the, in the modern, particularly in the modern cities where the single, single mothers and single ladies are really, really increasing. And uh, you find that... Uh, they're having children out of wedlock and most of these children are children of men either who are married or men who who have a lot of resources but don't want to be tied down or to be committed and uh a number of uh of guys uh even right now in, in we have this in kenya a lot of uh single ladies uh they are looking for men but the men who are available to them, they don't, they overlook them. They, 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 won't, they want men who actually, uh, and that's why we talk about delusions, the female delusions. The men they want actually are married or they don't exist. So uh, that is a big challenge. Now, so you're saying that um, this issue of 80-20 uh, does not apply. Okay, now, it also comes back also to the other thing about paternity. Uh, paternity tests, also we talk about 30% uh, of men normally fail paternity tests and those are the men who have felt they need to go for a paternity test majority of men raise kids that are not there without even knowing so um, majority of men it's a challenge Pardon? Did, you, did you say majority of men raise kids that are not there that's more than 50% majority but I will say many men many men do okay, that man, yeah, because okay, some yeah. That's, that's when guys actually realize those kids are not yours. Yeah, I so I, again, and just for the benefit of those who are listening, because I was quite surprised, you know, by all of this, what's going on in, in Kenya, because it sounds very much like what's happening in, in America and, and parts of the UK. So just for the benefit of those who are listening, so I, are a lot of men, because again, I, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite surprised, are a lot of men raised is to be um what would you call it face to mouth in terms of to be like with their women because again i just can't understand a man who is his girlfriend or yeah, wife cheats on him and he still stays with her that isn't that's i don't understand yes, that. that's not even out for a beta that's just like common sense why would you stay with a woman who's gone out she's stepped out on you then she's not your woman anymore or can you just explain why men feel that um they have to stay with a woman who is unfaithful to them i think you spoke about the cockholdness in kenya okay uh of course men are hardwired not to want women who are faith who are unfaithful eh? but uh we have uh we have men 
who who have uh, sort of internalized this romantic ideal eh? and uh, they believe in the like the soulmate myth uh they believe that uh uh when you love a woman and you show her that you love her even if she cheats on you she's going to come back and things like that and then of course men who operate from scarcity they they invest themselves in one woman and they don't know how they can get any other woman so they put up with bad behavior they put up with infidelity and so on and so forth so that that happens a lot and um it's no, because polygamy? of any doesn't like polygamy pardon is that polygamy is that not practiced much in, in Kenya but I'm from Nigeria polygamy is very is normalized it's not so that's why again I'm trying to understand even for those men yeah is it not is it not the norm to have maybe multiple wives or even girlfriends I'm not saying that culturally I mean it's correct but it is very common when I was brought up that men have multiple girlfriends or multiple wives so that's why this one I just say talk about in your book I, I looked at it as mm. more of a Eurocentric or a, or a white phenomenon I didn't re- I didn't so I used to always associate African culture with men being polygamous or having multiple girlfriends mm. if they can provide for them I'm not saying every man does it but that's why the whole one night thing I never really associated it with Africa that's why hearing what you were talking about in Kenya was going on and the whole one night is I found it quite surprising so can you talk a little bit again expand more about that that phenomenon yes of course uh, I, in Kenya a lot of majority of people are Christians so you know Christians talk about monogamy so there is that that's why polygamy is not practiced a lot and then uh, we of course we have very modern women who also don't want to share uh, their husbands uh, and it's a western value monogamy has been inherited from the west then of course uh, also the men who have resources and uh, who are alpha are the ones who are able to to handle uh, polygamy because women really oppose and fight back uh, from polygamy so unless you are a man who is able to put up with uh, the kind of conflict that is going to generate most guys just they stay away from it either they keep side chicks or they become uh, the they engage in uh, extramarital affairs so that is what uh, most guys do uh, they don't look at uh, polygamy as a solution because of the way we've been uh, socialized particularly from the west and the religion yeah so thank you for clarifying that and sorry can we now touch on um can we phase off about the thick discipline and the sexual discipline can you, can you talk about your thoughts about so, thick discipline, whether you think it's important for men to have yeah so the thing about dick discipline uh it is in very it isn't it comes in various forms uh the first one is um uh, just dick discipline in the sense that uh uh we have people who just waste time on social media you know watching videos uh, photos of girls uh some of them either masturbate or they just waste a lot of time getting into the dms of these women and trying to get their attention in the hope that they are going to sleep with them but what normally happens also is these women finesse them they tell you send fair yeah it's very common send me fair then i'll come and they eat your money others send more they these women engage you in some some bullshit online friendship then she tells you by the way my mother is sick uh, i need 10000 and this guy goes and gets a loan and sends her the money and then the woman disappears so there is that aspect of this dick discipline where someone is just following his dick he doesn't think then there is also the aspect of uh, dick discipline where because a man is prioritizing sex with his wife or with his woman he cannot say no to her you know like she tells him this place where we are living is not nice we need to go and live at another place so because he's afraid that she can with the whole sex he just does whatever she wants to his own detriment either he, to his own financial ruin or he just does things that uh, that ruin him financially or even health wise you know uh, he does what the wife does he wants to please the wife so that is also another aspect of dick discipline because what we've seen is that many women lead the households today because the men prioritize uh, pussy so much that uh, they cannot think they cannot think the woman controls her will so much power just because the men lack a dick discipline so those are the two aspects of dick discipline and uh, 
we talk to men about 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 that uh, in terms of uh, how you lose your strength and power and authority as a man and how you fail to realize your potential as a man because you're wasting time and you're wasting your resources on women who are not even taking you seriously. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Again, just for the benefit of those who are listening, I'm speaking to Jacob Elias, who is a best-selling author from Kenya. He has written um, 14 books, both fiction and non-fiction books, including the best-selling Unplugged series. It's a three-part series, which is available from Nuria Bookstore, which is a book um, about Red Pill, which is teaching men how to be competent, high value, alpha men, and, and understand female nature and navigate modern day um, relationships. Again, you can pick up his books at Luria uh, Bookstores. I'm, I've been speaking to um, Jacob about um, his writing career, how he became a, a best-selling author, some of the controversies that he's faced, and um, and also how he turned some of those controversies and criticisms in a positive light, um, where Black Adidas has become a bestseller. Um, both men and women um, are purchasing and reading his books um, and he's also hosting a, num um, a number of male-only um, events which I want to speak to him about shortly. I think the next event is in a, in a couple, of, couple of days. Um, so Jacob, do you Before mind? You Sorry. Just hold on. There are guys here who are asking, they want to, they, uh, they are going to, they want to go live with, with the Biba, can't they? Do I accept? I'm going to ignore this. <laughs> Can we, let's finish this, um, give us another maybe 15 minutes, because I want to wrap okay. it and then maybe we can go live with other people. This is, this is your okay. time now, remember I want to upload this on my page and YouTube, so I want to really dedicate this to you and maybe even have, and, um, I'm enjoying the conversation, um, so yeah, let, people can join a bit later so they don't mind waiting a bit. Um, so another matter, I'm glad we've spoken about a number of things. Another thing that um, which you spoke about at the Nuria bookstore, which I, I did get more insight when I read, listened to you, and obviously when I read your book, was um, the um, one of my grievances with Red Pill was I, I kind of looked at it as this is a, I know you call it a praxeology, or I consider it to be an ideology that's based on the views and the theories of why put as like white middle class men and I was thinking it why is it that we as black Africans why aren't we producing our own thought leaders and obviously you've explained um, the reasons why that it's not just uh, for white people for Americans it's some ideas that can benefit people irrespective of their race um, one of the things that um, I did like actually you mentioned in the book was um, you spoke about maybe even like the different attitudes or approaches towards like sex because obviously that's my that's my arena as an erotologist where you spoke about how I think you mentioned Kevin Samuels he spoke about sex being transactional whereas Roland Tomasi for example he, he argued otherwise um, what are your thoughts about about sex and in terms of how men should view sex obviously with women and what, what are your thoughts on that is, is it transactional is it spiritual is it could it just be for procreational purposes recreational what, what are your thoughts about sex and uh, um, and how men should do sex. Okay. Um, as far as uh, as sex, uh, what we normally say is that uh, there's always a price that a man has to pay uh, for sex. You may not have to pay it in terms of money, but you pay it maybe in terms of your time, or you have to be qualified. Because for, for a woman to agree to have uh, sex with you, you must have met some certain qualification or criteria because women always have uh, standards. Just because women normally have much more to lose when it, from the sexual encounter, they can get pregnant and so on and so forth. So you as a man, either you're attractive, you're charismatic, you're funny and so on, you must have qualified yourself. And uh, in many cases, uh, there'll be some price to pay maybe in terms of a date and so on and so forth. But red pill perspective of sex, procreation and pleasure, that is what it is uh, looked at. Uh, that's how it's looked at. And also we look at uh, what we call the biological imperative of a man. The biological imperative of a man, meaning how we are wired as men is we want to spread our seeds. So uh, relationships between men and women, we 
think that it is more optimal for a man if you're in a relationship that allows you to have children to spread your seeds that is very very important and that's why we get into the controversy of uh, cuckoldry and being stepfathers and things like that because we feel that if, if you put yourself in a situation where you are becoming a stepfather then you're fathering that woman's sexual imperative and abandoning yours yours should be to have your own children to spread your own bloodline uh, so that is how we look at that's how we look at sex uh, between the man and the woman and also uh, so basically it's just that now as far as uh, sex being spiritual I, I think now that one is up for debate depends on who you ask and so on and so forth if you have religious beliefs and so on people talk about soul ties uh, and things like that but we look at it purely in terms of uh, a naturalistic and a scientific view yeah thank, thank you a couple of points before we wrap up or before you want to bring other people on um what advice would you give um to any aspiring writer or author so someone who wants to become a writer like yourself because you know you've written an impressive array of books um again very well researched i'm um, speaking about speaking from a range of sources so i'm just wondering what advice would you give because you've got experience of both fiction and non-fiction but what advice would you give to any aspiring writer especially a black person yeah so it's, it's this is a very interesting question you know what i've seen okay let me start with me when i started writing what i wanted to do was i started writing okay i've been writing for the longest time but i started publishing books in 2018 and when i started publishing books i wanted to be one of the best writers in africa and uh, my strategy i always knew that because i read stories of stephen king and a number of these big authors i knew that uh, uh, a number of their initial books were never hit they never got uh, they never got a splash so even myself i decided that uh, mentally i knew that i would probably write six between six and eight books for me to get noticed or any kind of a claim so i decided to be waking up very early i wake up at three i go to bed early i wake up at three to write or read and uh, my strategy was i will publish at least one book every year there are years like 2022 i published four books so my my approach was to just do a lot of writing but being very aware about the quality and uh, being very intentional about becoming a better writer in terms of improving with every book and so it was uh, a lot of work and it involves I, I was thinking of myself as a beast in terms of just being very prolific so, so many authors there are some guys who just want to write one book. They don't want to be known as authors. Maybe they just want to write their story. And so, so that also matters. So it depends on your ambition uh, of being an author. How good do you want to be? Do you want to be among the best authors or you just want to write books? Because if you just want to write books, of course you can write books. You have editors who can polish your work and make them uh, very, very presentable. But if you also want to write books that uh, will leave a lasting impact, then you have to be careful about your subject. And also you have to be very keen about the quality of your work. You need to be able to, we normally say that the primary job of an author is to get the, the reader's attention. So uh, when it comes to writing of fiction, we talk about show, don't tell, descriptive writing and things like that. Or you could also be writing to to create a social impact the way i've done with unplugged you want to influence a society you probably have a certain ideology you know the people like ayn rand who wrote atlas shrugged objectivism and so on so it depends on on your objective but uh, for me what i know is that um, any young author who wants to write you need to be patient you need to be outcome independent because you can write a book that nobody cares about. Don't be discouraged. Just write another. And I normally tell guys the best way to sell your book is to write another book. So write another and another and another. And very soon you're going to hit uh, the mark and people will pay attention and will recognize uh, your work. 
So I think that is the main thing. Do a lot of work, be very keen, and read a lot. Of course, you, for you to be a good writer, you have to read a lot. You have to read a lot so that uh, you can appreciate what other writers are doing and you can borrow styles, ideas, and so on from, from other authors. So be patient. It's not something that uh, you can do overnight. Uh, here in Kenya, we have challenges with uh, the quality of print work uh, and even in terms of uh, page layout, cover design, sometimes it's difficult to get people can do a good job. But uh, the more you stay in the trade, the more you, you network and you'll get to know who can actually give you a good a good product. No, that, yeah. that's fantastic. I love that. No, thank you. I love that. And I think I resonated with what you said on so many levels because even when I, I started, my, I published my first book in 2012 and I had the ambition so I wanted to actually write 10 books within 5 or 10 years, but I didn't really share that with too many people. Obviously, I didn't achieve that task, but I, I can understand what you're saying in the sense that you had an ambition, even when you, before you published your first book, you wanted to write multiple. And I think that's something that, like you said, there's some books you know that some people are going to resonate with more than others, but you were thinking about writing multiple books. And if the first book, or one book doesn't necessarily hit home, You've already got another one and i just think that's important to have that mindset and the fact that you're not an overnight success because you've been reading for a number of years but whilst people are thinking wow you know jacob's published you know 14 books in in, in, in less than 10 years but in reality you've been reading and preparing for a number of years so and that's great that's great that's great but just a second point did you always have that inner belief, like courage, to be a writer? Because a number of people that I come across, they always say that they want to write a book, but they're worried about, you know, like the feedback because some people might not like it, this, that, and the other. You, you don't appear to have that um, issue. You seem to have that self confidence. Is that natural? Or did you develop it over time? Yeah, so as far as the skill, uh, I've always wanted to write and I've always been developing my skill as a writer and i do that through writing a lot i've i've been published in academic journals i've written in newspapers i've written blog posts i have so many blogs before i started writing books i used to have blogs i write a lot on facebook and uh, so that, that writing just becomes second nature i started it when i was uh, 13 years i started keeping journals so i started writing just expressing my thoughts and so on but also there's something i i also noticed uh, there's a young author who approached me who wanted me to advise them how they can also write a book that can be a bestseller and uh, uh, the one thing i told them maybe i'm wrong i don't know because i always uh, i told them that for you to want to to write a very good book you need to be a bit crazy because it needs a lot of work and commitment and dedication and single-minded focus uh because even as we speak by the way uh there are people who think that the book is a bestseller because I'm a very good marketer. Uh, there are people who who insisted that uh, there are people who say that I'm taking advantage of men who are bitter. <laughs> yeah, so there are some people who don't admit eh, that uh, the quality of your work is good and it has hit, uh, made an impact and so on. So the th thing I struggled the most with as an author was my subject what do i write about for the longest time i i was not reading even fiction but there was a time i wrote a story on facebook it was a story of fiction and guys told me if you wrote this you're in the wrong career you're supposed to write a book and first of all this will not be on facebook somebody will steal it put it on a book we are going to buy it that is when i decided to start writing and that's when i started writing fiction but my strength i think has been on non-fiction because I spent a lot of time reading uh, and writing non-fiction uh, academia kind of stuff so for me it, it worked well for me because by writing a lot of fiction I'm very good at uh, dialogues and narrat narrating events and describing characters and emotions and so on so when now and I combine it also with uh, non-fictional stuff then the book is very very engaging so I also encourage uh, authors to be to be dynamic. Don't 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 put your, don't pigeonhole yourself. People will tell you like even right now, uh, the next book I want to write. There are people who tell me no 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 don't write that. You write on masculinity. 
this is what you're good at, this is what you're known for, and so on. So people should be, I encourage guys to be ready to explore. If this doesn't work, you can try another. Write anything that uh, that resonates with you, that uh, that feels exciting to your heart, that you feel excited about. Uh, so I think that was my thing. I was never confident. Uh, I never knew that uh, I could be a bestseller, particularly at this stage. But I really have I had a very strong desire and determination uh, that that if I did it a lot and I did it very well, the world was going to pay attention at some point. But I don't think I, I I'm not sure I really knew that I had it in me. I just knew that if I work hard and I stay focused, something will happen. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. That's that's great to hear. And just the last point on that, one of the things that I was I'm really impressed with in Kenya is um that like there seems to be a strong reading culture to the point where I was shocked at how many um vendors were selling like pirate books. Because in the UK, even in in Nigeria, you won't find that. People are not selling I know I don't support people selling pirate books, but it even shows that there's an eagerness for people to read. You know, whereas like yeah. in the UK it might be people selling fake once upon a time CDs or, or you know, but that just shows that um the literacy level and that's why i was so surprised especially going to nuria to see meeting yourself and others that there's so many authors and um yeah again i think it's very important for black people i think kenya can definitely be an inspiration for, for other africans and even um, um those of us who are living in, in the west in, in the uk and, and in america because we don't have many black writers and thought leaders so yeah i definitely was um inspired and like, appreciative of that so i definitely would um, to yeah. Kenya for that. But just uh, before we wrap up, or before you bring on any more guests, um, can you touch on, can you talk about your upcoming event, what it's about, um, how people can you know, attend or buy tickets, and if you've got other um, upcoming events coming up, do you mind touching on that, please? Yeah, so I have, uh, I call it uh, Unplugged Men's uh, uh, Meetup. Uh, what has happened is that uh, when guys Dead and plugged, there was uh, a need for guys to. They felt okay, fine. So we've read this book. Uh, we've unplugged. Now what? So I have a WhatsApp group. We normally exchange ideas, uh, but guys also felt that you know we need to meet each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to form a community uh, of men. So that's why I set up this meetup. Uh, it is actually the second one this year, and. Uh, what we normally do in these meetups is basically just to sit together, share experiences, know each other, because we've interacted a lot on WhatsApp. Now we need to uh, put name faces to names. And uh, it's a good opportunity for networking and for encouraging each other, uh, particularly as men, just by sharing our journeys, our experiences as men, and uh, also advising uh, each other. A lot of young guys come there just looking for advice. Some of it is career advice. Some of it is legal advice, some of it is relationship advice, and some guys just need encouragement. Uh, there are some guys who are very down, and uh, they just need to be told that, uh, you know, you can still bounce back, and uh, they still hope. So when they hear stories of guys who've overcome, it really encourages them. So so I think that is the, the purpose of that meeting, just to network, to get to know each other. And sometimes some guys also have ideas about things you can do, uh, together you know like camping uh maybe some trips and so on and so forth common projects so we will see uh what comes up uh but we will be meeting somewhere in nairobi a place called uh, uh castle garden it's on my wall for those who are interested uh both on tiktok and on on facebook i'll post the details there we'll be meeting uh tomorrow in the evening oh tomorrow oh wow okay so I'll put this up tonight, I'll upload this tonight, but yeah, so it's probably um, it'll be too late for... Uh, do you have any upcoming events, or if people want to, actually, just if people want to keep in contact with you again, because because I'm going to upload this on my Instagram and YouTube, so can you let people know the best way people to contact you is the email, is it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, can you let people no, know how to contact you, the best way, and to get your books? Yeah, Facebook is easiest. My books, uh, for those guys who are not in Kenya, they're also available on Amazon. Uh, all my books are available on Amazon. But you can also get them from the Nuria Bookstore, for those who are in Nairobi. Nuria Bookstore and uh, Textbook Center. Uh, you 
can also contact me on Facebook. Uh, uh, I deliver also. And uh, you can email me, jacobaliet, one word, at gmail.com. But you can also contact me on uh, Ndiko Aliet on uh, Instagram. And on TikTok, um, Unplugged VIP. Uh, so you can also contact me uh, through those ones. And thank you so much, Abib, for uh, letting guys know about uh, these books. No, I appreciate it again. I appreciate your work again. As, as uh, I know how difficult it is to write books, and I want people to hate about your journey. Um, and again, for people to be inspired by it. But I, th I think it, yeah, you're doing great work, and I think it's important to amplify as a brother, Afri as an African brother, to amplify your work and people outside of Kenya to, to not only be familiar with your work, but also the up upcoming work that you're doing. Um, I think it's okay. How many books have you written, by the way? Seven. So half of half um, half of you. <laughs> Seven. Okay. Yeah, we will also be talking about your books at some point. Yeah. You know, one of my books is interesting because one uh, one of my books, is, um, uh, um, one of my early books, it was about womanizing, but from an African perspective, and a lot of the views were similar to what Red Pill was saying because I wrote that book in 2016 so it was before i even heard about red Bull. but a lot of the news that you're talking about i was familiar with it but from a traditional like west african perspective i never associated it with with red pill like the importance of having sexual discipline the importance of not putting a woman before yourself having been goal orientated but i didn't frame it as red pill so that's why like i said i just saw as that's what it is to be a man or high and quality man from a traditional African perspective. Now, when I wrote that book, um, I got a lot of backlash, especially because I used to give some talks at universities because I also wrote about history and religious history. And a number of um, universities in the UK deplatformed me because they said I was encouraging men to be womanizers and to, to sleep around. And I was just telling men that, you know, if you're going to sleep around or if you're going to approach women, these are some of the things that you need to be aware of and also some of the consequences because to make it out like men don't enjoy, especially at one stage in their life, dating women, that would be a lie. There's men that do it, but if you're going to do it, obviously make sure you do it in a consensual way and you know and you understand women, like you don't be quite aggressive and rude and stuff like that. But at the same time, um, like I said, in the West or in the UK in particular, that book got a lot of backlash. So it was the platform, like I said, for a number of universities and I didn't and I stopped kind of talking about it because the whole concept of womanizing is very controversial in, in the West. But I was just talking about if you're going to do it, do it in an ethical way and, and things like that. But um, yeah, so that's why for me, I didn't associate that with red pill. It just, that, that's what it is to be a man. I'm, a lot of men, especially in our 20s and our teenage years, are going to go through that stage. But you should also have sexual discipline because a number of men who are controlled by their dick, what happens is that they get into situations that they don't want, whether it's unwanted pregnancies, whether it's a honey trap, like I've been involved in a couple of honey traps in my younger days, and it's something that, you know, it can, it's, it's something that men need to be aware of, you know, so it's, a, but that, for me, it was just giving practical advice to a younger man in his early 20s or um, teenage years in terms of how to navigate relationships before he's ready to settle down. So, um, but yeah, I can understand, again, like I said, some of what you spoke about, a lot of what you spoke about, about the, um, the, the, the gyno Christy or the, the gynocentric approach in, in the Western world and men feeling emasculated. But I just associate yeah. that as that Western, but African traditionally, again, like every time when I went back home to like West Africa, Nigeria, it was very different to the West, but I never looked at the West African or the Islamic mindset of what it means to be a man was red pill. That was just very different to the West. But um, yeah, anyway, I, I, I'm conscious of the time and I want to make sure you save this so I can upload it. Do you, want to, do you want other people to join or do you want to save this so it's saved on your page and then we can let people join after? It's up to you, but I just want to make sure we don't lose this life because it's a lot of um, valuable content. Correct. Eh? The, my, my, the event I have for men's is not tomorrow, it's on Saturday. It's on Saturday. Yeah, okay, great. It's on Saturday. So I'll, I'll upload it so tonight. I don't... But I was thinking maybe we, we can let guys join and then uh, we'll save it later. Okay, sure, but please make sure you save it. That's, what I, that's the only thing I'm conscious of. But yeah, if you want to add, let people join, by all means, it's, it's, again, it's your, it's your life. So, so they're going to pop up in the screen? 
Yes, they should do. I think you can add, I think, another two people. So it allows four people at one time. So if anyone sends there's a, a quick request, I think someone... Uh, there's a, there's a question. Uh, are you able to see the question somebody asked? If someone asks... I can't see the question unless someone puts it in the comment. So if <laughs> someone called uh, Salvador Aguina, what are the visible indicators of the high value man? He's asking what are the visible indicators. Uh, I can see we have uh, Atomic Martin is one who has joined us. These other guys have accepted, uh, but they're, they're invited, but they're not. So uh, I don't know whether that person is still online. So we discussed the visible indicators of the high value man uh, that what are the visible indicators of the high value man so the visible indicators i think wealth uh, this was be resourceful uh, they are going to have what we call uh, social proof social proof is basically the way you respect them you know they interact with others the way you have other high value men responding to them they should be social proof and uh, in general, uh, high-value men also, uh, they conduct themselves uh, the way they carry themselves, they are confident, uh, shoulders back, chin up. They don't, uh, they don't uh, conduct themselves like they are uh, uh, self facing or shy and so on. So those are some of the markers of uh, the high-value man. Of course, depending on the culture, uh, the kind of regalia they put on can also be a, uh, an indicator because uh, people talk about uh, adornment also sometimes get status uh, society. I hope that answers. So, Atomic Martin, how are you? Welcome to the show. Do you have any comments, any questions? Um, okay, I don't have any questions. I'm just uh, glad to be here. Uh, it's been a lovely session. I've really enjoyed myself and I learned a lot too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I can see we have like uh, another nine people who are watching. Is there a mechanism for guys to be able to. Uh, they saying you can only have three co hosts. Okay. Um, I'm asking any other question. You know what? We definitely have to do another one on my um, page because I think it'll be good. I want to have like okay. yourself, Jacob, on my page again to maybe do a live like this because I know a lot of men who probably would want to contribute because it's very difficult to find a man, a black man in particular, who's an intellectual who can talk about challenging subjects like this. Um, so definitely, we, mm. if we definitely need to do another one um, on, on my page. Hopefully, when when Facebook, when Instagram stops banning me from IG Live, so we definitely have to do that. Okay. So I can save this. Yes, please. But if, we're, if, if you're happy, if you want to, there's no more um, people that want to join. Please make sure you save no, it. It might take about 10, 15 minutes because it's over an hour to load, and then I will then upload it on my page. So thank you so much, Abi, for this. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, the conversation also helps me to clarify a number of the thoughts that I have and the things I take for granted. So I appreciate you for that, and I think it is important to challenge every idea that uh, uh, we, we actually hold or share so that uh, we have clarity of thoughts and uh, we don't end up having ideas that are actually false or that are defective. So I appreciate you for that and I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. No, likewise, thank you very much, Brother. Much respect and we'll keep in touch. Okay, thank you. So let me end it and save. Please do.